Uh, yeah, it is showing. Yeah, it is. The red button is showing on my on the thing. Yeah. Ha, Roini, now pause it, no? Just pause it. Function at I am Bangalore. I completed my PGP in '94 from IMB, and before my MBA, I worked for three years in a steel plant. And post MBA, I was with the ITC Group, with the Merchant Banking function. I was there with them for two years, and I went on to. Uh, go on my own for almost two decades. I have uh, done multiple businesses. I have uh, developed multiple products, software products. I have uh, this was recently written a book. I am hoping to get it published by Q1 of next year. So this session, that's a quick uh, introduction about myself. And uh, uh, some of uh, the things that I'm going to say right now in this session, uh, is, is related to the kind of experience I have had and also to uh, the fact that I'm associated with uh, another entity called Magic Hive, where uh, they, uh, their counseling center that's focused on parents and children and where some of the insights that I'd be sharing I have drawn from. So let's get started. Let me uh, lay down the context for the session and uh, briefly what is the session going to cover. I had briefly talk about uh, what is experience, the role of language in expressing experience, what are frames of references, reframing, you can read them on the uh, slide. And the structure of beliefs is from the linguistic perspective. How do we express our beliefs through language? And, and also, what is uh, the meta structure? What, what, what are beliefs connected to? Uh, what are the various things that impact beliefs? I am hoping that the participants would, uh, at the end of the session, get better clarity on how beliefs work, how does it impact various aspects of our life. Sometimes you are not even aware of its impact. How do you identify those beliefs that limit your progress? and some strategies that can help you overcome your limiting beliefs. This is about the session for today. So let's kickstart the session. So this is uh, some of you who are familiar with NLP, uh, Neuro Linguistic Program. Programming would be able to relate this diagram to NLP. So essentially, uh, the first question that one might like to ask is, how do you experience the world? So uh, essentially, we have the primary modes of experiencing the world, which uh, we, we refer to as the modes of perception. We have the five sensory channels. We have uh, the auditory, the kinesthetic, the visual, the hearing, the sense, the smell, olfactory, etc. Apart from it, we also have a secondary way of experiencing the world, and that is what the session is kind of all about. It is about language and how language impacts the way we experience the world. When we use language, we the words that constitute language are all anchors. Each word that we actually uh, uh, each word represents something that triggers something within us. For instance, when I say the word snake, each one of you is likely to respond differently to the word snake, which means that words have an impact on the way you experience something. And when you're experiencing the world, you essentially are looking at how you can enrich your experience. And uh, this would primarily mean that your the way you uh, experience through those five sensory organs, how can you build what we refer to as sensory activity? If you want to experience the world better, how is it that, can, that you can fine tune the way you perceive the world? Now this diagram very broadly captures what happens when we experience and interact with the world. We have some sensory inputs, that is a primary experience. We, we, uh, the, the, those inputs are basically stored in the memory, uh, science and neuroscience, we still don't know how it is stored. It is related to synaptic gaps and the neurons. And how, when we use language, 
to extract that experience and put it in some kind of a model. We call it a model, representational model or also the map of the world. So the idea is that we don't directly interact with reality, we interact with reality through models that we create in our head. Language, for example, helps us create those models. But language is, has certain restrictions. Right? You know, the spoken language cannot uh, capture everything that happens in the world. So we tend to distort, we tend to delete, we tend to generalize things that we see or hear. So essentially, when the belief systems that we actually have about various things are, are something that comes from the model that we create, each one has a very subjective experience, each one has a subjective model or map of the world through which we operate. Properly, uh, this, this, this is captured in a phrase that says, uh, the map is not the territory, the menu is not the dish. So uh, we, we basically interact with the world through these models. There are also, when we uh, experience the world, there are certain constraining factors. Language that constrains the way we experience the world through deletion distortion. The primary experience of uh, you know, using your senses, the, 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 the eyes, uh, the smell, etc. There also, they have neurological constraints. For example, I cannot hear frequencies below 20 hertz and above 20 k hertz. So the body imposes certain constraints on us, which ensures that we don't experience the reality in its totality. Similarly, we, we uh, can't smell everything. Uh, we don't have uh, the activity there as good as a dog, for example. We can't smell everything. So uh, we can't see everything. You know, we can't see objects are very small. So there are certain constraints imposed by the body, which is uh, reasonably universal amongst us. That ensures that we don't experience everything. But at the same time, we have certain social constraints. Social constraints, so for example, let me give you an example of a tribe called Maidu in California. They, they have their language represents color and only by, by uh, using three words. Uh, for instance, in the English language, we have the pure. So there are, there are seven colors to, uh, to describe uh, um, color. So which means uh, a person who speaks English has a better way of, uh, has a better enriching experience of, of describing objects than a tribe from Maidu. But Maidu, if they want to experience the world better, then they can learn the English language. So those are what we refer to as social constraints. They're not neurological. The body is not imposing those constraints. But the, the social uh, constraints are just language. So that, that is very briefly about how we experience the world. So I just mentioned that language, it has been universally found that language uh, is one of the key components that help us build these mental models. And it has great influence how we perceive and respond to, to the world around us. And you, as you already know, language is something that is unique to human beings and, and it helps us uh, develop our uh, you know, experience in terms of a much more deeper enriching experience of work. Yeah, the primary and secondary experience I just already mentioned about how uh, uh, the secondary experience is through the mental models that we have and language playing a very important role. Representational maps is something I briefly mentioned. Uh, again, as I said, we don't operate on reality directly. We operate through models that we create in our head. And each one creates his own model based on his own experience, memories. There's so many other contexts that actually help in creating our, our model for the world. So let's do a quick uh, exercise. Uh, you can just note down your thoughts on each of these sentences. I'll be listing a few sentences and then we can revisit them later. It will probably take a few minutes or five minutes on this. So the first sentence says, teenagers of today are disconnected from the extended family. So you can just jot, jot down some of your thoughts around this sentence. 
or whatever comes to your mind is fine. Most marital problems are because of the degeneration of the joint family system. To succeed in life, one must work hard. Children should wish elders as a mark of respect. Too much money at a young age causes one to be arrogant and irresponsible. I know she does not like me because she looked the other way this morning. People who are active on social media love to socialize and are extroverted. To start a business, one must have an original idea. So you can just jot down your high level thoughts on these sentences on a piece of paper. Let me just take a, a minute or a two break so that you can jot down your thoughts. There is a very famous saying that there is nothing good or bad about the world. It is the thinking that makes it so. I'll just leave the thought in your head that was attributed to Shakespeare. Another thought that comes to my mind as you as you're writing and talking down your thoughts on the eight points is about how a secondary experience is also something that comes from our inner world. So if we experience the world, one is there are the external elements, the environment that determine the kind of models they create in my head. And there are certain internal figures. The internal figures are my memories, my value systems, my belief systems. Fantasies, imagination, hallucination, they are all triggers that, that don't map into something that's really a happen. That's something that you create in your inner world. So the models that you create are influenced by external experiences and also the inner, inner world responses to certain things that happen inside your head and that is not map to reality. All evidence. So another 30 seconds and we'll move on. Here's another thought. Uh, when many of you who could have perhaps uh, you know, attended uh, the Pasana or Yoga or Atha or whatever, where one of the uh, most important exercises that is given to you as a very basic ex uh, exercise is to, is to become aware of your sensations in the body. That's called uptime awareness. Or basically awareness about uptime and downtime. So awareness about what's happening around you and awareness about what's happening inside your body. The whole idea being that the primary experiences are the most important experiences and an important way that you experience the world through your five senses. Everything else is created out of that primary experience. So the primary experience is richer. The models that you can create that are based on the primary experiences can be richer. That's the basic logic. So shall we move on? 
So I guess if that's it, let's move on to the next slide. Now, again, uh, this slide is about how language frames experience. I will later on take, uh, take on a separate section on what frames are all about. Um, in terms of different kinds of frames that we use in our daily life. A frame is like a photo frame. You know, uh, the, uh, the word frame also comes from that particular context. When you have a photo frame, the photo frame, the frame around a photograph enables you to focus on what is inside the frame. It sets a boundary. It ensures that what is, what is it that you focus on and intuitively what is it that you wouldn't be focusing on. So the frame defines a boundary that allows you to draw your attention to a specific experience. Even language, language that we actually use can frame the way you experience the world. Let me give you a simple example. So on your slide you have a sentence that says, it is hot today and it will rain tomorrow. I, I just leave it to you in terms of, you know, how, whatever you might, however way you might like to interpret the sentence. Now I am going to change the, the connective word and and replace it with but. It is hot today, but it will rain tomorrow. It is hot today, even though it will rain tomorrow. As you step back and reflect on what are the implications and how do you respond to each of the sentences, you would perhaps realize that when I say it, it is hot today, but it will rain tomorrow, appears to shift the experience, the importance of it will rain tomorrow vis-a-vis -vis it is hot today. Or rather, there are two experiences of uh, it is hot today and rain tomorrow. By, by using language, we can shift the way you are going to experience something. What we refer to as foreground, foreground and background. So you are, by using the connective word bath, but you can ensure that the experience of raining tomorrow, it will rain tomorrow, is, is brought to the foreground. And by using something like even though it is hot today, even though it will rain tomorrow, shifts the experience, the focus, draws your attention to it as hot today. So when you use a word and as a connective, both of them appear to be pretty much on the, on the same at the same level. So by even using simple connective words, you can shift the way you experience something. Either you can bring an experience to the foreground or you can move it to the background. There's another example just below that. You can do whatever you want to if you're willing to work hard enough. So you can just read the sentence once again and check out what are the internal responses that you, how do you internally respond to this statement through your thoughts, your feelings. Now, I, I can rephrase this sentence and I can read it as, if you are willing to work hard enough, you can do whatever you want to. Can, can you sense the difference by just shifting the, these phrases? The first one, you can do whatever you want to, if you're willing to work hard, is very empowering. It focuses on whatever you want to, irrespective of what, uh, the, the uh, difficulties that you might face. It's very empowering. But when you say if you're willing to work hard enough, you can do whatever you want to, shifts the first part to the foreground, which appears to be a task that is pretty hard and difficult. So the way you're going to respond to the statement is going to be very different. So I did the whole idea of the slide is to just make you aware that language plays a very important role in framing the way you experience the world. At the beginning, uh, I mentioned that all words are anchors. They anchor you to a specific kind of a uh, response based on your own experience. It evokes certain emotions. The word snake, I have given the example of, of snake, of dog, and knife. All words, all words anchor you to something. In fact, it is said that the best way to 
if you want to learn something, the best way to do it is to name it. Because when you name something, it anchors you to something. It anchors you to, to a thought, to a feeling, to a particular kind of a behavior, to a kind of a response. So now that you know what exactly are frames, frames essentially enables you to shift your attention and focus on something that's inside the frame and also ensures that you don't focus on something that's outside the frame. We do the we do the, do this framing constantly and, and there are different types of frames that we use. The first one is called for, for I'm giving you a few examples of frames. It's called an outcome frame. Now, uh, many of you would probably be familiar about the, the importance of how people keep talking about goal setting, how you need to be focused on outcomes, etc. Now, that's an example of outcome framing. So, when you frame the outcome, you are focused on the outcome. So, basically, you draw your attention to the outcome. And when you do that, all that you do, for example, the kind of resources that you wish to have to achieve the outcome, or the activities that you wish to pursue, or the tasks that you wish to pursue to achieve those outcomes, are focused on the relevancy of those things to achieving the outcome. In that respect, there are certain resources, there are certain activities you might neglect, or you might find it irrelevant with respect to the outcome that you want. So when you have it, when you work with an outcome frame, you're focused on the goal and you would choose resources and activities that are aligned to achieving those outcomes. So with us individuals, we are there are many of us who would like to uh, write down our goals, who like who are very clear and even if it's not written down on all the outcomes that you want in a specific situation. So that's called outcome framing. There are some who are focused on, there's another frame called problem, problem frame. So outcome framing is, is something like the first sentence is, what, what do I want? So you're focused on the outcome. So when you talk about problem framing, you're focused on the problems. So that can come unconsciously to you, or it could be in your conscious awareness. So these are certain patterns, these frames are patterns that we actually start adopting and most of us are really not, not um, aware of the fact that we use these frames constantly. For example, the problem frame would, would make you focus on what is it that I need to avoid. So, you, For example, let me uh, give you an instance of suppose you are going for a holiday. So there are some who go for a holiday because you love traveling, you want to meet people, you want to visit places, and there are some who would go for a holiday because it, it's, uh, it's a stress, it's stress buster, or maybe because you want to ensure that you know there's peace at home, your wife and your the child, uh, they're constantly asking you for a holiday. So that, for example, is to avoid discomfort, to avoid problems at home, you go for a holiday. That's called the problem um, frame. Though the outcome, you might still go. So when you when you observe someone on a holiday, the end outcome is the same, but the way you have approached the outcome is very different. One is when you uh, when you avoid something to get something, and when one is when you actually want something, you go for it. So there are people when you are in a presentation, for instance. You would have someone who is constantly telling you, hey, this is not going to work. Uh, I don't think uh, you understood the problem. So these are people who come from a problem frame. They are looking at what are the potential problems that you could face in a specific situation. For instance, an entrepreneur, when he starts, he doesn't analyze too much. He just wants to go ahead and do something. You know, they, they are usually entrepreneurs work from an outcome frame. So these are certain patterns that we actually exhibit when we when we uh, work, uh, maybe some con subconsciously or consciously. These are decision-making patterns that we constantly use. So entrepreneurs, for instance, are usually outcome frame-based. They have that pattern that they exhibit. So they are focused on 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 what I need to be doing. They don't think too much about the problems. For example, an auditor or an accountant is trained to find the problems in your financial accounts. 
they are trained to find issues. So, and so is a, uh, a program, software programmer who is in the bug fixing. He is looking at what is wrong with their code. A lawyer is looking for loopholes uh, in, in the legal system to bail you out. So these are these are professions and professions who are constantly looking at what is wrong with something, and they can make a great career out of it. But the focus, once again, this is just to highlight the fact that we all work in different uh, frames. Sometimes we are aware of it. Sometimes we are not. There is another frame called intention frame. Intention frame is essentially a very powerful frame which enables you to focus on what is the intention behind the behavior. So when you when you find a thief stealing a bank, you can either go by the behavior and there are consequences. He may get punished, he may get arrested. And another way to look at it is what is what made him rob the bank? Maybe he, he has a problem at home. He's, he's financially he meets his need for financial security. So if you understand the intent behind the behavior, it enables you to connect to the needs that underlie your behavior. So the focus is so when you look at a behavior, it's so important to to separate the intentions vis-a-vis -vis the behavior. We also have another frame called feedback versus failure frame. So sometimes when we look at something, we we uh, look at it as a failure. Uh, you, you can say my uh, I have failed in my business, or you can say I have experienced something different in my business. So it's it's the way, and there's a feedback when you say I have experienced something. So there's a feedback for you from from which you can learn and move forward. So that's a feedback. If you we call it a feedback as a failure. Do you look at something as a failure or do you look at something as an experience from which you can learn and move forward? So how can I rephrase using language and, uh, and, and convert a feedback to failure frame? There's another frame called asset frame. Asset frame is basically moving something from an impossible kind of a situation to a possible. And you assume that something will happen. If I say I can't do this, it's impossible. You could always ask someone, what, is it, what will it do for you if it's possible for you to do it? How will you be feeling? What will you be thinking? So we, we basically open up the, the, uh, the window of possibility by using an asset frame. So these are different frames that we use. And these frames can be very powerful. For example, when belief systems are frames, are beliefs are things that frame our experience. OK, let me go to that next frame so that is uh, these are the, the some some of the frames and references i already referred to in the last slide we also have something called reframing reframing is like you know you, you have a photograph and you, you frame it with another frame and it looks different so essentially the idea of reframing is uh, how can i put a new frame around an experience so that i interpret that experience very differently when I can do that, it enables me to look at the world differently. So this is something that I can consciously do by using language. So one of the first reframing methods is called content reframing. Content reframing is essentially where I am able to um, reinterpret something that I'm actually seeing in front of me. I, I have a behavior that's being exhibited. Can I read a different meaning to it? There are some examples that I have uh, listed down. For example, you, you could say uh, uh, he is self-centered and keeps to himself. Now, if, if you want to uh, reframe that, you can say, "Hey, he 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 likes to uh, uh, he, he likes silence and he enjoys being in his own company." Now, if if you rephrase it that way, you realize that. The way you phrase it changes the way you experience something. If you find that your child, for example, is uh, very um, you know, silent in class or does not talk to anyone, does not have friends, if you rephrase it and say, hey, uh, maybe he perhaps he likes to think a lot. He's the a, he's a kind of person who likes to reflect. And he's, he's a thinker. So when, when you look at it that way, you look at a child differently. So it, it is the way you want to re, reinterpret something. So it's the behavior is the same, 
the meaning you attach to the behavior is, is different. For example, if my, my, my mother does not trust me, she wants to know where I go and whom I meet. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is hey, my mother is uh, concerned about my personal safety and that is why she asks me these questions. Now when you look at it that way, it's more empowering. You're able to connect to your mom uh, better and you understand the space that she's coming from. So it's just, a, it's just the way you think about something that can change the way you experience something. The next is a frame size. Frame size is basically uh, it is is the same as what we are the next point context reframing, but I put in a different uh, heading because it's a very interesting uh, thing. We constantly use frame size. Frame size is, for example, uh, time. When you look at something in in a ten minute time frame, it's very different from when you look at something say from a uh, longer time frame. Something that seems to be very urgent and important in the short term, over the long term, you, you might probably dismiss it and say, hey, this is such a silly thing that I did when I was young. So when you increase the time frame, time frame, for instance, is one of the frame sizes. The, if you expand your time frame, or what we often refer to as can I see the bigger picture with respect to time, with respect to space, with respect to whatever variable, so it gives a different meaning to what I'm actually uh, experiencing. For, for let me give you an example. If you want to have a 10-minute meeting on something in your office, uh, typically when you hear the word 10 minutes, uh, I, I, one knows that it's perhaps it's a task-oriented meeting. So you're very focused on what you need to discuss in 10 minutes. But suppose I say you let's have a brainstorming session and. Uh, it's for three, four hours. You know, three, four hours it's, uh, also means it, it, you can build relationships in that meeting. So the implications are very different. So if you want to have a strategy session, maybe it's longer. It's not that you're always talking about strategies, also building relationships. The phrases that we usually use for generations to come, 100 years from now, that those are with respect to time. A childbirth in the immediate uh, for a young mother for the first child can be a traumatic experience. But when she realizes that there are others who have gone, there are millions of other mothers who have gone through uh, a similar experience, it, it perhaps gives us uh, a quiet confidence that she can also get through it. So uh, this once again is, is something to do with frame size. Context reframing is when we change the context in which a behavior actually occurs. Now, uh, let me give you an example. Your 12-year-old son is a bully and fights with other children. So if your teacher tells you that, uh, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is how, how can this behavior be helpful in another situation? Maybe if you have a younger daughter and, and your son has a, a sister, this kind of behavior can be useful because he, he will be able to protect his sister. So the same behavior, when you look at it through another context, has a different implication. You can say my having my another example is having my in-laws stay with us is so demanding and intrusive. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is uh, when you're staying with your in-laws, it 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 uh, allows you to spend more time on something else because they they also share your uh, chores at home. So when you when the same in-laws are looked at through another context, you realize that you know, the way you respond to your in-laws is going to be different. Yeah. So another uh, reframing exercise is how you re we have been doing just that right now. How do you redefine using language? So you can re redefine by using words uh, that that change your experience. Now, for example. Uh, I've given an example. Uh, my boss is stubborn and opinionated. So that is one way of looking at it. Another way is you can redefine stubborn and opinionated by saying that my boss is assertive, you know, and is very clear about what he wants. So when when you define it that way, the implications are very different. You're redefining something. When you say uh, we often use uh, words. For example, when you you no longer call someone blind, you you call them visually challenged. So if you rephrase it that way, it has a different implication. 
you 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 wouldn't call someone a housemaid now you probably call them a house help janitorial services you probably call them waste management experts right so so these are the way these are the things that we actually do when we try to redefine someone we do it constantly yeah some might call it politically correct but all these things change the way you experience the world a statement like max can be hard or difficult can we redefine that it's challenging and it's it's an, uh, it's an interesting opportunity to learn something new so when when you when you uh, convert a problem basically what you're doing right now in the frames if you have noticed you are you are trying to convert the frames so when you have a problem you are trying to move the from the problem frame to an outcome frame there are many instances in life when you look around you you have people complaining about a lot of things like this is not okay that is not okay uh, my, uh, my staff is not okay people around my in laws are not okay but they wouldn't be able to articulate what exactly they want for themselves they are constantly operating from the problem frame so they are not able to tell clearly articulate clearly what is that they want so the reframing exercises through using language can be helpful in in shifting one from a problem frame to either a outcome frame or, or or a feedback frame or you look at look at look at the behavior through the intention frame there's another interesting idea of chunking up down and lateral which is something we use most of the time we we do it just to bring it to your awareness that we have i have to this chunking chunking is essentially where we organize um uh, experiences into bigger or smaller pieces uh, i i recall during the 19 when i was doing my mba we had uh, theodore levet who had written this classic called marketing myopia and he had a very interesting very famous phrase that he used to ask businessmen or business leaders he would say what business are you in okay and uh, essentially the idea was he was one of the first uh, uh, thinkers uh, who uh, started uh, triggering people to think uh, away from what they produced and reorient them towards customer needs basically moving away from the products to what the customer is needing then that is basically an example of chunking up to give you an example now when when a, you are in the car business are you into the car business are you are you into a transportation business right are you into uh, freight trains and uh, transportation of uh, goods by train or are you into the transportation business so when you look at yourself as a transportation business the way you look at your business is very very different that's an example of chunking up or what we refer to as generalization how do i generalize an experience and chunk it up to something it's a, or you can call it a bird's eye view so when you chunk up something in fact the beliefs that we actually have of everything they are all uh, example of generalization we tend to generalize criticisms are generalizations so chunking is basically the ability to uh, move attention between something that is general and something that is specific so chunking up is moving from specific to general chunking down is from going from general to uh, specific sometimes it's very useful to think in terms of smaller chunks when i want to write a book for instance it, it can be overwhelming for me to write a book but when i chunk it down to chapters the time that i need to spend every week on writing the number of pages that i need to write it is that much more easier for me to work with the smaller chunks so i chunk down the problem sometimes you'll chunk up the problem so that you don't miss the woods for the trees you are you are in a brainstorming session you don't want to get into operational details you want to look at the bigger picture now that there you consciously go into a chunking up position where you start generalizing criticism is a way we usually criticism as i mentioned is again uh, you know where we get into generalization that will not work you are you are not good i have no friends no one loves me these are these are all basically unhelpful either criticisms that are very generic in nature it's not specific 
So this gen and, and the chunking lateral is also in terms of thinking we call it inductive chunking up down and lateral also uh, is related to inductive detective and objective kind of reasoning that we have. So in induction is basically we chunk up generalized detective is chunking down and objective is looking for similarities or metaphors. So for example I remember Muhammad Ali uh, the, the boxer. Uh, he used to be described as uh, someone who floats like a butterfly and stings like a bee. I'm sure most of you have Now that is a metaphor to describe uh, his, his style of fighting. That's an objective way of chunking, right? So I'll, I'll give a stop here. It's 30 minutes now. And uh, any any questions, I'd like you to uh, I'd like you to uh, put down your questions on the chat window. Anything that you wish to share as of now. Whatever you have uh, been hearing, any questions, any thoughts, you can, you can keep in the chat window. If you have any questions, you can, you can put it in the chat window and I will take it fast and then we have the time. So any questions? Any specific questions? Okay, so let's move on then. Sure enough. So I, I, I was just mentioning about chunking up and chunking down. For example, there are the same words that can be chunked up and chunked down. Let, let me give you an instance. I, I uh, probably, if, if I were to say I'm a, I'm a failure, or my business has been a failure, one way to look at it is I can chunk it down. I can chunk it down, go to the nitty gritty, check out what has gone wrong. Is the marketing? Is it the processes? Is the people? I can keep chunking it to uh, lower uh, degrees. And another way to do it also, I can chunk chunk up. Uh, I can chunk up certain things. For example, uh, uh, if, if, if I were to say that uh, I'm not attractive, I can rephrase the, uh, the way I'm expressing myself and chunk it up and say I am I'm different from others instead of saying I'm un, uh, I'm not attractive. Failure can be chunked up to something like uh, it's, it's a feedback and it's an experience from which I can learn. That is chunking up. So I don't say my business has failed. I have had an experience of business which is different. So I can say uh, the, the, the experience that I have has different consequences, uh, but it has been a, it has certain consequences. But again, it's, it's a feedback for me to in terms of how I can improve. So so that's again a failure that can be chunked up, or a failure that can be chunked down. Just a thought. Okay, now I'm trying to go to the next. Okay, now here's a, uh, here's a quick uh, exercise for you. Uh, you. You can see a fish on your screen. You, you can probably jot down your thoughts when you see this uh, picture. What were the thoughts come to your mind? Now you see the next picture. You can just jot down your thoughts when you see this picture. Now these pictures are basically going to illustrate whatever I've been discussing in a pictorial form so that it's easy to relate. And there's a third picture and you can jot down your thoughts out here too. Now I want you to uh, step back and ask yourself as to what were you thinking and feeling when you saw these three pictures. So let me let me try to uh, you know uh, make certain assumptions out here and uh, check out what you perhaps were thinking when you saw these pictures. The first picture when I just had a fish, maybe it was it, it didn't mean anything to you. It's just a fish, and and your feelings and emotions were were neutral. When I now increase the frame size, you had another fish. 
that's going to eat at the smaller fish, then the way you experience the second picture is very different. Maybe you're feeling sad for the small fish, and then you're reconciling and then say, hey, the big fish genuinely needs to eat, and you can't do much about it, right? And, and the smaller fish doesn't seem to be aware that it's in danger. Now, when you go to the third picture, you realize that the, the fish in the middle is not aware of the danger from a much bigger fish. Now, when I ask, I increase my frame size, the way you experience the same pictures is, 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 is very, very different. Now, this example is pictorially to give you an idea of what a frame size is all about. When you increase the frame size, which is what we refer to as context reframing, the way you experience what you're seeing is going to be very, very different. So, as I said, frame size can be with respect to time, with respect to area, geography, anything. Now, here's a then here's a uh, illustration. This is actually from from my forthcoming book uh, that should hopefully get published by a Q and of next year. Now, this is an example of reframing, something that happens in, in our day-to-day -day life. You, you have someone who's honking the car, you can just read it aloud. I mean, you, you can read it for yourself, you know what I'm talking about. How you can reframe the way you think about something. And this, this picture is not about just reframing, it's also about intention reframing. So when you look at someone who's honking the car, you're, you're in the you get more empathetic and try to understand why, what is it behind, what is it behind the behavior. And maybe he wants to reach his destination on time. And then you are, you're more comfortable with that kind of thinking. Now here's another example of how you can look at the same thing differently. There is one who thinks the business is not doing well. There's another one who thinks it's a fantastic Thing the sales are growing, so you can. And this is what happens in e-commerce all the time. So the number of customers keep increasing. You're you're uh, having bigger and bigger losses, but people say, "Hey, the business is doing fantastic." Right. So these are different ways of interpreting the same event. Here's another example. So here's an example of. Uh, how you can reframe using an intention frame, yeah, or you can also do a content reframing. And, and usually what we're referring to uh, right now, uh, please remember, is all uh, from the logical side. Uh, it's not from the emotional side, it's from the logical side. Questioning the, uh, the, the reframing part, etc., is, is more to do with using language, more on the analytical side. There is one very important component which we don't discuss in this uh, session is on the role of emotions in, in establishing rapport or in establishing connection with people. Before you get into logic, you would like to establish a rapport through an emotional connect. That is not covered in this session, but uh, I just wanted to let you know that there is another aspect of connecting to people. Now, before we get into uh, the next slide, I wanted to have a quick brief on uh, a quick uh, sharing of what needs and values are. Needs and values, uh, like many of you are perhaps aware of, are, are usually uh, used interchangeably. Uh, needs is something that we have had from uh, Maxwell's theory of needs. Uh, and, and value is something that we constantly uh, keep hearing about creating value and uh, business value, uh, customer value proposition, CVP, et cetera, et cetera. But what exactly are values and what exactly are needs? Uh, is there a difference? Usually it's used interchangeably. I, I look at it slightly differently. Now, uh, needs, for instance, are a set of things uh, that we have listed down which enriches the way we experience the world. Uh, for uh, example, uh, if you look at the master's hierarchy of needs, at the, the bottom most you have physiological needs you know, for, for, for safety, security, etc., uh, etc. Et now, that essentially uh, relates to physiological needs. 
and and the levels about that they call them psychological needs. Uh, they are basically abstractions. They are basically ideas about about uh, other kinds of needs you know, that one might have. Uh, those are just ideas. They are not physical, tangible objects. For example, need for privacy, need for acceptance, need for acknowledgement, need for freedom, uh, a need for uh, in integrity, self-expression, and a need to grow, need to be authentic. Now, these are different needs that we have. Uh, need for compassion, structure, fun. Now, these are different kinds of needs that actually are ideas or abstractions. Now, each of these needs obviously has been listed down as a need. Uh, because it has an inherent value in, in terms of how we can make the uh, lives uh, more meaningful and enrich our lives. So, for example, I might have a need for peace, but I wouldn't say I have a need for violence. The violence is not something that I want. So, when we list down some, uh, those needs, we are looking at something that enriches our life. It has an inher inherent value, and that is why we want to seek those needs and meet those needs. Now, what exactly are values? Values is basically very subjective. The way I distinguish between needs and values is we have something called an enhanced value. Every need has an intrinsic value to it, inherent value in it. But when we enhance it through our own uh, interpretations, it becomes more valuable to us. Every need is valuable, but when you uh, add your own subjective experience and interpretation, it becomes more valuable to us. So value is a very subjective terminology that has an implication of uh, subject to cognitive processes. So it's, it's like, uh, it's a very individual thing in terms of, let me give an example. Suppose you have a need for honesty. Now, honesty has, uh, can mean different things to different people. For me, it could mean that, you know, uh, not accept, accepting or paying a bribe. For someone, it could just mean that uh, the need for being fair. Uh, for someone else, it can just mean that you're transparent in your feelings. So the, the, the word honesty and need can have different interpretations. And value actually comes from interpretation. So value has two uh, uh, characteristics. One is interpreting or meaning. We call it semantics. So, uh, and very subjective, it's very individualistic. So what I value is very different from what you might value. And it can also change with respect to time, with this place. And, and, um, and prioritization. Right now, today, uh, I may place a higher value on knowledge, vis-a-vis -vis something, vis-a-vis -vis health, or I may give higher priority to wealth, vis-a-vis -vis health. Tomorrow, it will be the other way now. So, value keeps changing. Needs don't change. That's why when you have in businesses, business terminology, you talk about creating value for customers. You don't talk about creating needs. Needs are always there. Values are, are the ones that you actually create, or you prioritize, or you change the meaning. So how do you do that by changing the meaning? How do you prioritize? I just wanted to bring this in perspective because uh, value usually, you know, people would tend to uh, attach it to economic value, needs and wants, etc. Here I'm not talking from that frame of reference. I'm not talking about economic, what's a luxury item, what's a want, and is, is it a survival or non-survival, etc. This is basically the value need not be always linked to economics. So, for example, freedom is valuable to you. It has nothing to do with economics. Yeah. You don't have to attach everything to money. So, values play a very important role within motivation. Values and needs. That's why we say in, in, um, uh, even in marketing or in business, how can I meet my customers' needs? You don't talk about meeting customers' values. So, you talk about needs. So uh, ultimately, you're meeting the needs. Value is the interpretation of uh, the subjective interpretation. And needs play a very important role in terms of how it can trigger uh, action. Um, though it used to be, once upon a time, uh, believed to be causative, and I'd still like to use uh, causes action, because when I say causes, I'm also um, factoring the cognitive processes of meaning. So needs cause action or triggers action. And, and behind every, every behavior is a, is a need that is being met, right? When a thief is stealing a bank, there's a need for security for him. That's why he's stealing the bank. So you focus on the intent, the need, rather than the behavior. And, and uh, having a need actually motivates, is very motivating for people. It's a, it's a driver. It's a motivational driver. It provides energy to move forward. 
So values and goals, same thing. If you, if you have uh, uh, goal, uh, goals, basically are, are uh, something that is set so that it meets your needs or meets values. So, in, in fact, uh, in this context, let me also put it this way: people play different roles in society. The roles that we all play are different roles. Uh, basically, are vehicles to meet certain needs of us. So, when you say values and goals, you can also look at it as needs. As we say, needs, values, they're all interchanged. If you know in what context they're speaking about these two words, then that's okay. Now, uh, quickly, structure of meaning. So, what is what does meaning exactly mean? Meaning is basically, you know, we, we have a whole uh, uh, subject called axiology, which is, which is basically semantics. Uh, there's, there's a very famous uh, book, uh, you know, I forget the name. Um, so, it was the, the father of semantics is called Arthur Korsbisky. And uh, how it, it deals with how we derive meaning and how uh, important meaning is, how is it represented internally. So, meaning is basically it means having something in mind, which, which basically translates into inner representations of what we see outside. I have spoken about mental maps and reality. And we operate out of these uh, mental maps. So the mental maps that we create, uh, the, it, it's like a wrapper in uh, your, your uh, computer lingo. Uh, it's like a wrapper, uh, or you have a class in the instantiation if you want to take the IT lingo. So a, a wrapper would, or like an API, you know, in the background you have the primary experience that you're actually storing, information you're storing in the neurons, in the synaptic gaps, etc. Now, you create certain mental maps of what you're perceiving uh, through those sensory uh, uh, experiences. And, and those are the models through which we work. So, so, a mental model is something like a wrapper, like an API. So, if you want to change the background information, you can change the model. The way you perceive the human beliefs are from the models that you have created. And that can, again, impact the way you, you have uh, stored information. Right? So, The structure of meaning, it influences this, uh, anyway, uh, I've gone through this. Now, the meaning here, I just uh, wanted to add uh, something about meta messages. Meta messages are basically in the non-verbal communication. When you're, when you're talking to someone, you have, uh, one is the communication, what you're conveying through language, and, and second thing is also how you are, uh, uh, through non-verbal communication, communicating something. You, know, you might tell someone, hey, I love you. And, and basically, your tone and, and the facial expression don't convey the same thing. There's no congruence between your verbal and non-verbal communication. Those are called meta messages. Sometimes the, the message that is not really said in words are more powerful than the words themselves. So you need to be careful in communication in terms of what is it that you're conveying that goes beyond words. Because that, in, that impacts the way someone else is going to interpret what you're communicating. The power, the the, the uh, effectiveness of any communication is not in what you say, but what what uh, response you get from a communication. So please remember that very important. So obviously, the interpretations and meaning is very closely connected to the beliefs, the mental models that have created, and to the to the value systems. So you you usually connect the experience to, to uh, the beliefs, uh, connect values. To experiences and and uh, the meaning, the interpretation, the beliefs are all to do with um, uh, in, uh, thoughts, right? So the interpretation you that you give to your value connects that to the experience through meaning. Now I'm going to quickly uh, go back to the the first set of exercises that we had done. Uh, quickly, you can go through what you have uh, you have written. Yeah, so you, you, you can stay with some of your thoughts. I will uh, not analyze this too much, but if, if you, by and large, if you analyze, you realize that um, many of uh, these points are all beliefs that you actually have about various things. And uh, beliefs are to do with judgments that you pass, evaluations that you pass on events and, and, and around you. And I will be getting into beliefs uh, quickly. So these are all belief statements of different kinds. 
and what are the different kinds of beliefs we will know in the next few slides. Let us watch a video. I will show this. Okay, let me, uh, let me do this. Watch this quick video. So there you are, that, that, that was an interesting video about beliefs and, and how we form opinions of people based on what we see in front of us and what kind of things we attach to certain things. Like I said, words are only anchors, okay, based on your experiences about what you think someone needs, something needs to be. You know. So uh, that was a very interesting uh, quote ad in, that was released in the Middle East. Uh, so. So what exactly are beliefs? So beliefs are, the way I look at it is, beliefs are uh, accumulated thoughts. They are embedded thoughts that uh, you know, take the quality of being true for us, for us. It's very subjective. And it can become so embedded in you that it uh, becomes like rock solid. It's so difficult to change a belief. And um, you can change your thoughts, but changing your beliefs that get embedded over a period of time is not all that easy. And beliefs are all about judgments and evaluations that we have about ourselves, about, about others, and about the world around us. So usually, if you look at how beliefs are structured in terms of language and how we evaluate things, it, it relates to causation, meaning, and boundaries. So, and uh, causation, meaning, and boundaries with respect to the world around us, with respect to our behavior, capabilities, who we are, uh, and and uh, you know these are some of the things that can actually uh, uh, 
uh, impact the way we we actually think about a lot of things and how we interpret things. And how it gets manifested in, in language, like for example, in say position, you you uh, say uh, he makes me angry. Now that's a sentence that that seems to attribute causation of your anger to someone else, which perhaps may not be true. You know, and uh, that's that's an example of a belief that you might be uh, carrying. So, or or you could say, uh, you know, he gives me headache. I I've, I've shown an earlier cartoon with that, you know, where uh, a mother says the child causes me gives me headaches. Now again, that's a belief that's related to causation. So cause and effect is something where that that's something that defines relationships between entities, between ideas. That that uh, enables you to form certain beliefs. Uh, other, for example, in simple, you know, I can have these two words like love heaps or uh, power corrupts. So basically, this is cause effect. What I'm saying is, if we have power, it will corrupt. Now that's again a belief. Right? Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Now, now that again is a belief. You know, so some of, some of these beliefs uh, may be valid. Some of them can be questioned for, for lack of evidence. For example, if you say, if I criticize him more often, uh, he will learn to respect the rules. Uh, or in schools you have, you know, the belief might be that if I if you have very strict discipline, you, you can ensure that uh, children would uh, respect the rules. Now, that's a belief. That may be formal out of experience, but that might not uh, be true. So sometimes you might be so attached to the beliefs that you have that becomes a fact for you. Another generalized beliefs are usually generalizations. Now, another kind of a, uh, a belief would be about meaning. When you attach meaning, meaning is what linguistically we refer to as complex equivalence. When uh, when you say A is equal to B, uh, for example, if I say uh, she did not pick up my phone call, she must be angry at me. So now basically these are two experiences, two two different things. She's angry at me and she didn't pick up my call. But when I connect in, I mean, I'm connecting to them. I'm basically saying she didn't pick up my phone means she's angry at me. Now that's a belief. So when you start attaching meaning and uh, equate A to something else to B, now that that again causes that uh, that enables me to uh, form beliefs through meaning. Boundaries are basically when you start attaching boundaries to uh, something that you can do, you know, or your capabilities, or your skills, or the way you think. When you say I can't do this. For instance, I can't do this. Can't is basically to something to do with capabilities and skills. When you say I can't do this, you're limiting yourself. You're, you're in a problem frame and if you move into a, a, a different kind of possibility frame, you move to the asset frame. There's something that I had mentioned at the beginning. Asset is basically for possibility. What if you could do it? I can't swim. So what if you could swim? What stops you from uh, swimming? So once you start questioning, you start realizing that those beliefs can be expanded so that it gives you more meaning and 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 gives you a slightly more, much more bigger picture than the statement it's what it represents. So essentially beliefs have a some kind of a structure. It, it's cost, it comes out of uh, cost effect, uh, meaning and, and boundaries about people, about the world around us, about our self skills, etc. Yeah. So if you say, for example, your child comes back and says, I'm dumb. Now that's a belief. That that relates to, if you look at the slide, identity that, you know, I'm saying I'm dumb. Or, or uh, she is me. Now that, that again is a belief. Right? So you can question these beliefs by, by through, through language. Okay, neurological implication is basically beliefs. When you talk about beliefs, it's not just a uh, concept. It actually impacts the way the physiology works. And that's why you have something called the placebo effect. You know, uh, you go to a doctor and, and uh, he changes the way you think about something, and that can actually impact your physiology because the belief systems uh, are linked to the limbic system. It's a very ancient system in the brain that is uh, 
that is linked to emotions and to autonomous responses. So when you have a belief, it impacts your physiology. That is why you have these uh, light detector tests. You now, where they, if, if you have a belief and you and if you don't have a belief, it manifests itself in physiology, the way your your body responds, which they capture on the uh, light uh, detector. So beliefs have an impact on physiology, which basically means it can it can change your health status. There are there are people who have changed their beliefs and it has helped them get over when diseases like cancer. Right? So there are neurological implications of beliefs because it impacts your physiology. Now linguistic structure, this is exactly what I uh, in the last slide we went through some examples where where it, it comes from cause effect statements like if then something is because of something else something makes uh, something else, you know, uh, those, those are all, uh, my in-laws make me anxious, right? So those are all past effects where, where I might or might not have evidence. Just some time back, I recall I met someone, you know, around a month back and that person was going through some difficulty and he said, if a man cannot earn for his family, he is useless. Now, that, that's a very strong statement. So, so that again comes from belief system, right? So, uh, uh, students who are uh, who opt for arts after the 12th standard are not good at science. Now, that's a belief, right? That's a cause effect. So, there we are saying that you know, uh, or meaning, for instance, right? So, for, for example, you can see on your screen now uh, you can have a belief: the hard work causes success. Now, that's a belief, or you can associate lots of money with success. Success is a value that you actually crave for. So belief basically uh, connects value like success to an activity or to a resource or to evidence. So there you are, that's a linguistic structure. So belief statements, sometimes you want to uncover belief statements, you know, because a belief, if we say I am dumb, for instance, that's a belief, but that, that does not give you enough information. So if you want to uncover what that actually means, you need to make someone aware of what the what it actually is trying to convey. And and being aware is actually half the problem solved. So you could uh, ask what causes or what makes you think you're dumb, or what causes you to be, call yourself dumb. So you can talk about causes. You can talk. Uh, you can talk about mean. What does uh, dumb actually mean to you? Right? What is the evidence that you have that you're dumb? What is the consequences of being dumb? So once you're able to ask and look at different components of the belief uh, statement, you will get a much bigger and complete picture of the belief. So it's, a, it's, it's like a statement that we refer to it as, as a surface structure and deep structures. The language that I speak, right now I'm speaking, might not be exactly a replica of what I'm actually thinking, what is stored in my head. The language that's coming out, it's, it's a discrete uh, way of communicating. There are words, there are letters, etc., which might not represent the whole of my uh, experience that I have inside. So to uncover that, you can go through language. You can actually question. Through questioning, you can, you can try to uh, complete the whole belief statement. You know, and someone says, uh, marriage is not working because of my spouse. I have problems because of my spouse. So you can say, what causes you to believe that? What evidence do you have? What, what is the meaning of that? What is the consequence? So when, when you start addressing causes, meaning, evidence, and consequence, then you would actually be trying to formulate a complete belief statement, which will uh, help you understand uh, the various components of belief. Now, and there on the screen, you have lots of money means being successful. That you can you can use this uh, framework to to ask these questions. Okay, I'll show this later. I think we are we are going running short of time. Let me see if I can put it at the end. So, what, what exactly are limiting beliefs? So, limiting beliefs. There are three common areas of limiting beliefs. What we refer to as uh, you know, when you think uh, the situation is hopeless. Uh, and, or you're helpless in a particular situation, or you think it's not, you you feel you're not in a deserving, uh, you know, yeah, you don't deserve to achieve what you want. So these are the usually three large uh, buckets 
of, of limiting beliefs. So what it means is suppose you have an outcome that you have set for yourself and, and uh, you, you have this belief that irrespective of whether you have the skill with you, you're capable and you, uh, you know, you think you can't get that goal, it's impossible, you know, then you feel hopeless. So it's something to do with possibilities. If you think something is not possible, then you feel a, it's a hopeless situation. Helpless situation is when you think something is, you are clear about what you want, but you think you don't have the capabilities and the skills to get you there. Yeah? You think you're, you're, you don't have the skills. Third one is worthless. Sometimes you come across people who say that, you know, uh, I know I'm smart, I have the capabilities, I have the skills, I, uh, I want to, uh, I am very clear about the outcome, but I somehow think that uh, I'm not someone who uh, is a money-minded person, for example. So which means, that is the, though I have the skills, I know that I need to grow one, you know, uh, the outcome is I want to reach uh, uh, X uh, rupees uh, turnover, but I have something that says I'm, I'm not someone who likes money or, you know, then the, what happens is your identity level, there's the identity level or self-esteem level uh, uh, limiting belief that could limit you from pursuing uh, your goals with 100% effort, right? So these are three kinds of beliefs. The, the same thing that I just mentioned is presented slightly differently out here in terms of beliefs and expectations. So when you have a person who has to exhibit a certain behavior to reach an outcome that he wants, the first thing that you want to see is whether the outcome is desirable, right? So whether it's desirable and, and then you, you ask whether it's possible. Can I get the outcome that I want? Is it, is it something that I want for myself? Number two is what is my expectation that I can reach that outcome? What are my expectations on? Our expectations are motivational factors. They motivate you to actually uh, work towards the outcome that you want. So, what are, this is this actually comes from something called self-efficacy theories. Uh, it's a famous paper by Desi and Ryan, uh, and also there are a few other papers, uh, research papers on on, on Pandura and all that on self-regulation. And so, so and essentially, you talk about is the outcome desirable? Uh, what are my expectations that? You know, I'll, I'll, the outcome will actually occur. Uh, do I have, uh, uh, what are my beliefs about the behavior that, uh, uh, you know, is, is it ecological? Is it something that I'm comfortable with? Does it mean I have to cut trees uh, and, and uh, you know, do something so that I get the outcome that I want? And if I'm uncomfortable with that, I may not pursue it. So, is the behavior that I need to exhibit, is, is it something that I'm comfortable with? It's just ecological, right? So what are my expectations about the behavior that I can exhibit? And my expectations, the earlier was expectations about outcome, the expectations about my behavior instance. Do I have the skills that would help me exhibit the behavior that would actually help me get the outcome that I want for myself? Am I capable enough? What are my beliefs about my capabilities? And I, the, the last one is about self-esteem and, and uh, do I deserve this? So if I say that I don't deserve to be uh, having so much of money, you know, even if you have the capabilities to earn and if you're smart enough, uh, it's not going to get you what you want because you're, you're limiting yourself uh, uh, through, through beliefs about yourself, about self-esteem. That's related more to self-esteem. Now, metastructure, I think we are almost there now. Another five minutes will then try to wind up. So meta structure of beliefs is basically when you say meta, meta, the word meta is like you know HTML meta tags. The, those those are essentially beliefs itself is a model. You know, uh, whatever we've been talking about are this perspective, this of science is basically models in terms of what we observe and empirically and see if there a is there a pattern around what we are observing. Now meta structure of beliefs is something to do with uh, a structure about structure. So belief itself is a model uh, that comes from a representational model in the head. And metastructure is what is our, our belief about the beliefs, right? So if, if you look at this, um, essentially beliefs does uh, something in terms of trying to connect uh, values, that is intentions, uh, our experiences, uh, internal, internal states are basically emotions, you know, and, and uh, 
consequences. So, for example, suppose you're riding a cycle, and uh, you, uh, the belief that you have is, I, I can learn. And when you have this belief, uh, you, you could also, it would also translate into an internal state, an emotion, it can make you feel confident. And uh, I'm talking about an enabling belief out here. If, if you have an enabling belief that I can learn, then it would, it, would really, it would translate into an internal state of confidence. It will also uh, um, meet your expectations and uh, it, it will meet your needs, the values on the top that they have positive intentions for fun and improvement. So if I have the belief it meets my need, it meets the intent for me to have fun. And the experiences that they have. So even if I'm riding the cycle, if I fall, I will, I'll get up and I'll, I'll start cycling. I'm not going to give up because I have an enabling belief that has been installed in me. And my expectations and consequences is, I, even if I fall down, I'll say I'm getting better and better. Now the whole thing, okay. So, so uh, the same thing, this is an enabling belief. Suppose the belief that I have, the generalization has, that I cannot learn whatever I do then it will translate into an internal state of frustration. The emotions will be frustration and, and everything else will change. So that becomes a limiting belief. So a belief can be enabling or limiting. It, it is the way you want to look at it. Does a belief uh, map into the consequences that you want for yourself? If it does, then, then uh, it becomes enabling. If it, if it does not, it becomes limiting. So, uh, just to summarize what we have uh, covered in this particular session. Now, limiting beliefs, how to get over these limiting beliefs? So now we know the limiting beliefs are, uh, you know, health, it comes from hopelessness, helplessness, and worthlessness. The enabling beliefs, corresponding enabling beliefs is possibility. When you say, if you have believe that I'm in a hopeless situation, the belief of converting into a possibility can help you through questioning, you know. Uh, when you think questioning through you know, the slide that relates to process, evidences, meaning, and consequences, so you you can actually make it enabling. Um, so uh, here in this slide, we will just quickly summarize as to uh, how do we change these beliefs. So anything that limits us, how do we change the interpretation of what we are thinking about a belief? So one is through the intention group. A quick recap is when you look at a behavior, just don't go look at the don't look at the behavior, look at the intention behind the behavior. What needs of what needs are met by through the behavior, you know? And um, if, if a child comes back from school and he says, uh, I hate my teacher, now if if you go by that behavior, by the statement, you you are going to respond differently. You're going to probably start defending the teacher. You might say you're not supposed to talk like that about the teacher, etc. But if you, if you if you look beyond the behavior and, and look at what was the need that was not being met, you can dig deeper and you probably realize that the need that was not met was for acceptance in the school, right? So acknowledgement. Maybe the child did something it was not acknowledged by the teacher. He, he uh, interpreted he interprets it as uh, uh, the teacher does not like it. So. In intentions are very, very important. Intention also leads to compassion and to empathy. So we are basically listing down those patterns and strategies that we use, we have uh, covered in this uh, session, that will help you reframe the way you think about something, and that will in turn change your beliefs, in turn change your experience. And this is trying to uh, reaffirm and so that you're able to connect to the various concepts that have been covered in this session. Pattern reframing, what we uh, covered was to change the meaning of, of something, of a, of a particular behavior. So this again you can do through redefining, looking at a, a different meaning, giving something a different meaning. Uh, so that is basically uh, content reframing. Context reframing is when you look at a behavior in a different context. Uh, a child, uh, I had given the example of uh, a, a, a child who's said to be aggressive and who, you know, um, by the teacher, but the same uh, anger and aggressiveness will help in protecting his little sister. So if you look at it that way, you, you would be you'd be more empathetic towards the child. You know, that is con context reframing when you look at something through another context. 
redefining is where we have mentioned about i give you examples about how you rephrase something uh, you know uh, through single words as uh, phrases i give an example of uh, blind person visually challenged right uh, so so by by just fixing another word or rephrasing a word by another word or phrase by another phrase it, it is more empowering and it enables you to change the experience chunking up down and lateral we have again uh, done this this is very very powerful way of uh, doing things i i mentioned about uh, how it relates to inductive deductive and abductive reasoning and how you can break something from is a chunking is basically moving from general to specifics uh, to just like a uh, quick example you know in in uh, i had also given an example of theodor levet to just uh, related to a business scenario when in therapeutic uh, side uh, generalization or chunking up is a very powerful tool you know when you go to a um, uh, therapist and if you have a problem they will they, they might try to get uh, they might increase attempt to increase your frame size so that you look at uh, the context very differently framing frame size that it showed you about those uh, those, those fishes so uh, or you generalize a situation so that the behavior of the person uh, feels uh, or thinks differently about the particular uh, situation so you you could for example go to someone and he may say as you become aware of the potential that you have and you will experience that everything comes to you naturally and you're um, and and uh, you have everything in you to expand uh, your your uh, view of the world now if if someone makes it so general and not specific i, I just rattled off something that came to my head but basically this is a very generic statement uh, that has no evidence for anything but, but when someone uses words and phrases like that it it can mean different things to different people so for a for a patient who comes there who's feeling low when you when you actually chunk up and get into generalization that person would, would derive a meaning that suits his own circumstances so therapists use chunking up very frequently and strategy sessions brainstorming chunking up chunking down as you know you have a task oriented meeting you will have to chunk down chunking lateral is very powerful because it it's a very imaginative process where you use metaphors and and uh, uh, analogies i'll give the example of mohammad ali uh, floats like a butterfly and you know, things like a bee etc so for example um, uh, you know we have this phrase uh, called ugly duckling to to uh, to to basically talk about someone who's very unattractive right that's a lateral uh, that's redefining so uh, the chunking sideways would also be for example uh, where you're looking for similarities uh, um, between two things and that can help you be more creative and imagine learning a new skill for example i can i can relate learning a new skill is like driving a car for the first time you know so I, I, it's a metaphor that can that can help me understand a particular uh, even better. So these are all strategies. Now frame size we already discussed by increasing or decreasing your frame size with respect to time, with respect to space. You can change the way you experience the world and you interpret the world. Model of the world is how you 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 get into someone else's body. When I'm when I'm talking to another person and he comes when he's talking to me, he comes through his own belief systems. his belief system is based on the model of the world that he has created the mental maps in his mind and if i can get into the mental model can i empathize and get into the uh, that's what we call the second position or maybe even the third position where i can i can empathize and look at someone else through his own eyes of you know that becomes more empathetic so that's not another way to reinterpret the way i am looking at the world i i look at someone else and say hey there's something interesting to learn from him and i look at something his model that can change the way i look at the world counter example this again relates to you know i had put up a slide where you know to to uh, to, to frame a complete belief statement you can actually ask just four questions what causes you to, what causes something what is the evidence that you have what is the meaning and what are the consequences so you can actually ask for counter examples Uh, someone says i i cannot swim so you you can say what is the evidence that you have that you cannot swim so uh, if you say i i don't i i can't score in mathematics i am poor in mathematics what makes you so 
that is causation. What makes you so is causation. What is the evidence that you have that you're poor in mathematics is the evidence. So, uh, what is the consequence uh, that of, of not uh, of scoring low in mathematics? So, you could question different aspects of of a belief statement of a statement and and discover the deeper structure of what it actually means. That is uncovering the deeper structures from the surface structure from the spoken language. Value prioritization once again uh, can be very important. For you. So, so. Uh, uh, I had mentioned about value being. Uh, sir, I am sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Your slides are not visible. We are trying I to can... reach you on the chat. Okay. My voice is visible. Uh, voice? We are able to hear your audio, but your slides are not visible. So, okay. Yes, we are able to visit. But, but, since was it, but since when was it not visible? Was the last time last slide was visible? Yeah, last time it was visible. No, last last uh, slide. Getting over memory, no. please. Hello. Can you see the slide? Yeah, we can see the slides now. Hello, so actually, uh, hello. Yeah. When you start put the video, no, after that, it the slides were over. I thought you don't have slides, so that's why I didn't interrupt you. Oh, that is a long time back, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you were summarizing the session, sir. That's why, because after the watching the video, I think slides didn't come. And that is a long, long time back. Oh, okay. Okay. So these slides are not visible. That in uh, showing now. Now it's visible, sir. Yeah. At that no, no, time, I thought you were ended the session, so you're summarizing. So that's why I thought I didn't interrupt you. So the, these slides were not visible, is it? Looks like it. Ah yeah, after you said the watching the video, no? After that. Uh, oh, that that is almost uh, half an hour back. Twenty fifteen minutes back, sir. Fifteen yeah, twenty minutes. Yeah, back. yeah, yeah. I thought you were uh, you were summarizing the session. So sure, 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 sure. So that's why I'll, I'll probably you know. We can okay. share the slides with all, sir. No issues. After the the yeah. thing, we can share yeah. the slides with yeah. all. Okay, fine. So let me just okay. um, quickly uh, end it with uh, one or two videos. So so essentially to. Uh, I was I was attempting to put the whole uh, session into perspective and then summarize in terms of how we can get over limiting belief the various strategies that one can use. Uh, I will just end with uh, okay the benefits of the session. Uh, basically, we have shared some kind of a framework to understand belief structures uh, linguistically, and um, it can increase the self awareness. And the, the context is not about just personal growth; it's also about professional growth. I will just to end. Uh, I will play a couple of videos, and then if there are any questions, I will take those questions. I will just uh, just one second. Let me play this. You can you can see it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so we can see the video. Yeah. Okay.
Uh, okay, uh, so uh, I'm ending the session. I hope. Uh, can you see the slides? I, I'm not sure. Hello. You can. We after this thing again. slides you can put again. You have to share the slides. Sir. Again, is it okay now? Yeah. Now, now it's good. Good. yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that that was the end of the session. Uh, I'm I'm really sorry that you know there's some some goof up. Uh, I, th I think half the uh, presentation the slides were not visible. So last 20, 30 minutes were probably the most important part of one of the most important parts of the presentation, which, which had a lot of reference material in terms of diagrams, etc. I guess you know apologies for that. And um, if you have any queries, there's a chat window. You can just enter your. Uh, oh, someone has just mentioned uh, has a video started. Okay. Any queries that you have? Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Yeah. So, any, any queries that you have on the chat window, anything that you wish to ask or share, you can, you can draw a link. Hello. Uh, any yeah. of you have a question, please type in your chat window. No, all attendees, if you have a question, please post your questions in a chat window. So, sir will take the questions. All the okay. Hello. Uh, yeah, I think can you hear me? Are there, is there any questions? Yes, sir. I think no questions, sir. I think uh, I just checked. So you also check the chat window? Yeah, yeah. Hmm? Uh, there was okay. Can you please repeat uh, the child example in the con for context based uh, retrieval? Okay, let me just try to uh, think of what I actually mentioned. Okay, let me see. Let me try to remember what is the example I given. Okay, suppose you have a can you hear me? Uh, uh, Sushma, can you hear me? Sushma, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there's a question on can you repeat the child example for context based reframing? So I think I recall giving an example of uh, a teacher complaining to the parent and saying uh, your your child is very aggressive and he you know um, he exhibits aggressive behavior in the, in the class. He he teaches the younger children perhaps. So, you know. So uh, uh, one way to uh, look at that behavior is to uh, pull up your son and uh, pull up your child and you know and and uh, take out your anger on him. Another way to look at it is uh, if you change the context, maybe that anger, that aggressiveness, can be helpful in a different situation. Maybe if you if he has a younger sister and the younger sister is getting bullied or is being teased, he will be able to protect his younger sister. So, sir, and that's one example. Another example is, for example, uh, let's say if your your uh, teacher comes back to you and tells you that you know your child is hyperactive. You know that's a, that's a, again a phrase that people use or it's overactive in the class. Uh, on one hand, as a parent, uh, you might be concerned, and on the other hand, you might say being active means that just you can be rest assured that his. Uh, Curiosity and other other kind of you know characteristics of him are alive. So if you look at the same behavior, being overactive or hyperactive as a blessing, uh, because it can be very useful in a different context, then you can reframe the way you look at being hyperactive. Third example on the other side is where a child a parent a teacher comes and says your your child is very slow in learning, doesn't talk much to people. So uh, you can be worried. Or you can say, yeah, he, he he likes to be with himself. He thinks a lot. 
So uh, if, if you frame it that way, you're basically looking at the same behavior in a different context. And the context being that, you know, there are certain places where you need to, uh, you don't want to be in a rush when you have to make decisions, you don't have to talk too often, you just want to be in a reflective mode. So in those kind of contexts, this, this particular behavior can be very useful. I hope uh, that uh, gives you some kind of uh, perspective. Is there anything else? Yeah. Any other question? Okay, uh, again, apologies for uh, the, you know, uh, for the last, I think, half an hour. I mean, I didn't realize without the you know, slides, must have been kind of a challenge to uh, follow my uh, my, my uh, thoughts and, and my uh, talk. Uh, it will be available, it's being archived, so hopefully we will uh, put up the slides and you can follow them. Thank you so much and uh, hope you enjoyed this session. It's been a particular pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. So how do we exit? Okay.